This court, independent of, but in agreement with, the advisory sentence rendered by the jury does hereby impose the death penalty upon the defendant Theodore Robert Bundy. Although there have been serial killers who eluded the long arm of the law and remained in the shadows, the ones who are brought to justice and made to pay for their evil crimes end up paying for the rest of their lives. While court sentencing may bring about an end to a serial killer's reign of terror in the outside world, it often marks the start of a new journey behind bars. In today's video, I'll be revealing the special treatment that is given to these cold-blooded killers inside the prison walls and behind bars, a place where they can't hide. 9. Hated in Prison One of the first things you will learn about the life of serial killers behind bars is that the vast majority of them are not as terrifying as they were in the outside world. Since they tend to prey upon the weak and inoffensive, they apparently are not dangerous to anyone who can be dangerous back. A serial killer who fits this profile perfectly is Ted Bundy, who yelled for help when he was overpowered by his arresting officer in Pensacola. Considering this obvious weakness and the magnitude of their crimes, it's safe to say that they make perfect targets for other inmates to vent their frustrations about being locked up. There is also the added fact that most serial killers often have rape charges as well, and those kinds of offenders are despised almost as much as snitches and rats. If a person is in prison as an accused serial killer, then from the time they enter the facility, there is a high chance that their life will become hell. Under the unwritten code of the prison yard, said person is subject to mental, physical, and sexual assault at the hands of other inmates. A typical example of this treatment is seen in the case of Paul Bernardo, the schoolgirl killer or Scarborough rapist, as he was dubbed by the media, because his targets were schoolgirls who were unlucky enough to fall into his clutches. With the help of his former wife, Carla Homolka, the Canadian kidnapped, poisoned, raped, and then strangled his young, innocent victims to death. After he pleaded guilty to more than a dozen rape and sexual assault charges and was sentenced to life in Kingston Penitentiary in Ontario, Canada, life in prison was anything but calm or cushy for Bernardo. The schoolgirl killer has been shown the seven rings of hell by his fellow inmates as he serves his time. It was so bad that a fellow inmate, Carl Hiltz, became a hero in the prison, even receiving countless donations in fan letters because he assaulted Bernardo. Hiltz reportedly hit Bernardo so hard that the man who once terrorized a whole city almost lost an eye. Serial killers in prison are usually marked for death. They know this, the prison officials know this, and most of the inmates know it too. They would pounce in a second. 8. Kept in Perpetual Protective Custody Since a lot of prisoners themselves were similarly victimized when young and vulnerable, or have either brothers and sisters who were molested or raped too, Sharing the same prison yard with serial killers who double as sexual predators is the perfect recipe for disaster, or in this case, death. There are usually one too many inmates willing to show that they hate people who prey upon the weak and defenseless, and for this, there are no words needed, just weapons and fists. The prison system knows this, the inmates know this, and even the killers themselves know this too. So how are the convicted inmates expected to live long enough to serve their time in prison? Well, most of them are forced into protective custody because the worst could happen if they are in open view of other prisoners. In general, the prison authorities don't like the instability and craziness serial killers bring to the yard. This is why these killers are usually kept in solitary confinement for their own protection. At least 50% of incarcerated serial killers are said to live out their lives in protective custody. And even though the UN has waged war against isolation, calling it torture, it seems to be the only way to guarantee the safety of these killers. One such killer is Robert Maudsley, an infamous UK serial killer. Robert recently set a world record for the longest time spent in solitary confinement. The notorious killer broke the previous record by spending about 16,400 consecutive days in isolation in HMP Wakefield, according to the Mirror. The 69-year-old convict has been in solitary confinement in a glass cell since 1979, after being served a life sentence for his crimes in 1974. Maudsley, who earned the nickname Hannibal the Cannibal for allegedly eating one of his victim's brains, commented he is happy and content in solitary. His assured safety behind the glass confines might be the one reason for the positive feedback. The killer must now live out the rest of his days in an 18 foot by 15 foot cell built especially for him right after he got into the prison and was made with bulletproof glass. Maudsley spends about 23 hours of each day in his cell. He uses a concrete slab as a bed 
and the toilet and sink are bolted to the floor. It's almost sad that Maudsley and many other serial killers have to live like this in prison, just to get a decent chance of survival behind bars. But considering their crimes, some can argue that it's what they deserve. Being so effective, it has almost become a standard procedure for serial killers to be placed in protective custody. Another infamous killer who was treated with the saving grace of protective custody in prison was Jeffrey Dahmer. Despite being given the option of relative safety, the Milwaukee monster left on his own accord after some time, opting to join the general population. This, of course, proved to be a fatal mistake for him. And if you don't already know what happened to Dharma, you'll find out soon enough. 7. Rock Stars Behind Bars If there's one bad thing we humans have found out about ourselves, it's that people have a fascination with evil. It doesn't get more evil than serial killers. And it's not much of a surprise that some oddballs treat these murderous fiends like heroes among men. This odd phenomenon was once brought into focus on a popular radio show called LBC, when the presenter, Tom Swarbrick, got a call from a former prison officer who identified himself as Richard. Richard claimed that he worked in a Category A jail known to house some of the most violent criminals in the UK. The former prison official admitted to being shocked by the rock star treatment that was given to some of the serial killers jailed there. According to him, lavish parties and festivals were organized for the killers and other inmates inside the prison walls. The festivals featured caterers, magicians and DJs, all of whom were paid using taxpayers' money. While recounting the experience, Richard said, it was an outdoor festival because the prisoners felt that they were missing out on the outside because all these festivals were going on. They put a petition together and put it to the governor. I thought there's no way the governor would allow it, but he did. The reporting prison official even mentioned that a very well-known child killer was once greeted by the governor, shaken by the hand, and taken for a tour of the prison like a VIP before being assigned to a cell. The correctional officers were not allowed to approach that serial killer or even to caution them in any form whatsoever. The man in question was said to be so high profile that normal officers were banned from having interactions with him. Instead, they were made to treat him as someone to be catered to. Although Richard decided to withhold the name of the killer, this same treatment was replicated in the case of Charles Manson, a man that was perceived as a hero by his peers before and after he was convicted for multiple gruesome murders. While it was never proven that he was directly involved with the murders, Manson was the one who led a cult called The Family in everything they did. While behind bars, Manson still maintained control over some members of the family. To them and the new fans he had gotten, the evil mastermind was just like a rock star in jail. Among his diehard fans was Craig Hammond, aka Grey Wolf, who relocated all the way to California to be closer to his killer hero. Aside from Craig, there were ladies who were intrigued by the incarcerated man and were willing to do anything for him, including smuggling in contraband items like drugs, money, and other items that would have been hard to find in a jail cell. Even celebrities as notable as musicians Henry Rollins and Trent Reznor corresponded with Manson, naming him their idol. 6. Thrown into the Spotlight most serial killers usually have any and all information about their murders and crime spree pried out of them by the police and prosecutors before they are sentenced. But by the time they settle down behind bars, they find out that it won't be the last time they have to tell their story. Once locked up and safely tucked away, these people that are evil incarnate get a barrage of interview requests from several media houses and journalists looking to get inside their heads and pick their brains. As it turns out, these killers often do not mind reliving their glory days, and the prison system, despite its otherwise strict visitation policies, bends over backwards to accommodate these interview requests. While other inmates have limited contact with the outside world, as well as a regulated number of visits and visit durations, some serial killers are treated like instant celebrities and are allowed to spend obscene amounts of time granting interviews. An example of this is seen in the case of John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown. Well, I spent uh, two and a half hours with John Gacy listening to a whole new story about his case. During his crime spree, Gacy raped, tortured, and murdered at least 33 young boys and men. And yet, he was allowed to be the star of countless interviews without regard to time. The co-ed killer, Edmund Kemper, who murdered 10 people, including his mother, her best friend, and a 15-year-old, has been spending the rest of his life in prison since 1973. In that time, he's participated in various interviews and even two major documentaries. Kemper, who stated that he participated in the interviews to save people like him from killing, 
was given the chance to be treated like Oprah Winfrey on TV, despite his unspeakable crimes. To prove that this treatment is extended to a significant number of killers, it is also seen in the case of American serial killer Eileen Wuornos, who claimed seven lives in her murder spree while posing as a sex worker on the streets. Eileen was no stranger to being a star on TV before her death. In fact, she was allowed to grant interviews up until the day before her execution, and it was in that very interview that she demanded for death one last time. Nick, I'm not this the last time I'm going to say it. You have to kill Eileen Morris because she'll kill again. 5. Constant threat to life. While I've already established that serial killers are hated behind bars, there's still a need to determine just how far fellow inmates are willing to go to pass across their message. Is a punch in the face enough, or are the other inmates willing to go to more sinister lengths? Peter Sutcliffe, aka the Yorkshire Ripper, after being sentenced to 20 concurrent life terms for the murder of 13 women and attempted murder of five more, found out what it was like to be hunted in prison. Without the hope of protective custody to keep Sutcliffe safe, he tried to get into a more secure psychiatric unit. When that failed, the violent killer was attacked over and over again with murderous intent. While at HM Prison Parkhurst, he was first seriously assaulted by James Costello, a 35-year-old convict with several convictions for violence. While in the hospital wing at Parkhurst, Costello used a broken coffee jar to inflict injury to the left side of Sutcliffe's face. According to reports, the wounds required about 30 stitches. Shortly after the first incident, Sutcliffe was attacked in his room in Broadmoor's Henley Ward when Paul Wilson, an inmate who was convicted of robbery, asked to borrow a videotape. During the interaction, Paul attempted to strangle Sutcliffe with a cable from a pair of stereo headphones. On the 10th of March 1997, Sutcliffe lost vision in his left eye, and his right eye was severely damaged when he was attacked yet again by an inmate identified as Ian Kay. You might think that things couldn't get any worse for the convicted killer. But that is not the case, because on the 22nd of December 2007, Sutcliffe was attacked by yet another inmate. Patrick Sarida lunged at Sutcliffe with a metal cutlery knife while shouting, You f raping, murdering bastard. I'll blind your f other one. Sutcliffe flung himself backward, and the blade missed his right eye, stabbing him in the cheek. It shows how bad serial killers can have it in prison. But it could always get worse, because sometimes the biggest threat to their lives is themselves. 4. Suicide Watch the way it works, people who break the law have to live with the consequences, because sometimes the only consolation the victims of those crimes get is the knowledge that the criminals are paying for what they did. Serial killers, in most cases, get much worse punishments as a result of the magnitude of their crimes. However, some of them would rather die on their own terms than suffer the consequences of their actions. Tiago Henrique Gomez da Rocha, a Brazilian former security guard that was convicted for 11 serial murders, might have been thinking just that when he attempted to end his life in his prison cell a few days after he was caught. Consequently, da Rocha needed to be watched all the time. Our concern is with observing him constantly inside his cell. He has no love for himself, and he has already attempted suicide," said police chief Eduardo Prado, who was in charge of him at the time. With the suicidal killer proving to be a continuing danger to himself, it was left to the prison's management to take a very robust and more methodical control of Dorocha's safety. Joseph James D'Angelo, better known as the Golden State Killer, was believed to be responsible for a series of brutal rapes and murders in California in the 1970s and 80s, is another serial killer that the prison keeps a keen eye on. The now 77-year-old convict, who is one of California's most elusive serial killers, is now on suicide watch. It was right after he was apprehended that he started talking to himself. D'Angelo, who was confined to the psychiatric ward of Sacramento County Jail, said little after his arrest, but remained mumbling to himself, which was noticed. 3. The Ultimate Price while Sutcliffe experienced unimaginable pain in prison, some other serial killers have suffered worse fates behind bars. Don't think that's possible? In 1994, a high-profile serial killer who was in prison left his cell to conduct his daily assigned task. He was accompanied by two fellow inmates. The three were left unsupervised for about 20 minutes to clean a shower in the prison gym. The serial killer was discovered 20 minutes later on the floor of the bathrooms in the gym. He had been severely bludgeoned about the head and face with a 20-inch metal bar. His head had also repeatedly been bashed against a block wall. He was pronounced dead upon arrival at the hospital, and that particular serial killer was Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer. 
Jeffrey Dahmer, became known as the Milwaukee Cannibal when the remains of his victims were discovered in his apartment, some cooling off in his fridge and a large cooking pot. Dahmer was tried for his heinous crimes and sentenced to live out the rest of his life behind bars. But the unexpected happened soon after. Dahmer's sick and twisted sense of humor made him less than likely to make any friends at Wisconsin's Columbia Correctional Institution, where he served his sentence. Dahmer was known to play with his food, sculpting his dinner to look like severed limbs and using ketchup as blood. Some people who are in prison are repentant, but he was not one of them. Those were the words of Christopher Scarver, who decided on November 28, 1994, that he had had enough of the killer's antics. When he and Dharma were left alone and unsupervised in a gymnasium, Scarver beat the cannibal killer to death with a 20-inch metal bar from a piece of gym equipment. Scarver said, He started looking for the door pretty quick. I blocked him. He ended up dead. I put his head down. 2. Feared in prison As the saying goes, even a cornered animal will surely bite back. And it is especially true in the case of serial killers. Not all serial killers are treated like walking targets in prison. In fact, some of them inspire nothing but terror in other inmates. The serial killer of killers, Pedro Rodriguez Filho, was one of those that filled the prison yard with terror. Pedro, or Pedrino Matador as he was also known, was a convicted serial killer that had a rather unique choice of victims. He was a dangerous Brazilian that doubled as a vigilante with a vengeance for other violent criminals. Pedrino Matador was officially sentenced for 71 murders, including that of his father, but he claimed to have killed over 100 drug dealers, murderers, and rapists. While in prison, the serial killer of killers could no longer keep the streets of Brazil safe, so he opted for the next best option. He took out the trash in prison. Incarceration certainly did not deter Pedro. For him, prison was just a new chapter for the killings of other criminals. While serving his time, the Brazilian killed at least 47 inmates, and most of them who became victims were involved in murder cases. As the serial killer understood, they were the ones who deserved to be killed, and not innocent lives. That was how he continued to terrorize the prison until he left, and the rest of the population could do nothing but treat him with the respect and fear he commanded. The inmates, however, did try to fight back at some point, but they learned better after. There are reports of the prison vigilante being ambushed a couple of times during his dispensing of justice. 1. Simply treated well Believe it or not, sometimes a serial killer's life in jail is not as filled with misfortune as you might think. In fact, in most cases, these monstrous killers are treated like every other criminal. The infamous BTK killer, Dennis Rader, haunted Wichita, Kansas for 30 years and claimed the lives of 10 victims. His modus operandi was to bind, torture, and kill, hence the name BTK. Rader was finally apprehended and sentenced to live out his days at the El Dorado Correctional Facility, where he has been since 2005. After spending some time in solitary confinement due to the nature of his crimes, the same killer who terrorized a city for years was permitted to watch television and listen to the radio from the comfort of his own cell. In recent years, Raider seems to have gotten used to life behind bars and even refers to himself as prison pet because of how well he is taken care of, unlike many of his kind. As one would expect, the perks that the BTK killer enjoys have raised eyebrows in the criminal justice system and the world at large. Kevin O'Connor, a Sedgwick County Deputy District Attorney, expressed his concern about this treatment, saying, we're having a hard time understanding why somebody like this is allowed to earn privileges when all the evidence was presented as to how he can turn what most people would consider being innocent into something evil. David Berkowitz is another famous serial killer that falls in the same category. Formerly known as the Son of Sam and the 44 caliber killer, David killed six people in New York City between the years of 1976 and 77, while believing he received the instructions to kill from a neighbor's demon-possessed dog. Berkowitz is locked up in Shawangang Correctional Facility in New York. Though he could be granted parole, Berkowitz has yet to seek such a choice, preferring to remain in prison, which goes to show that he is quite content behind bars. In addition to having written and published a book, Son of Hope, the prison journals of David Berkowitz, the serial killer has turned to the Christian faith and spends his time working as a prison chaplain. Though this is more of a sobering prison experience, Berkowitz seems to have found a second life behind bars. As far as being treated well goes, Richard the Night Stalker Ramirez had his rotting teeth completely repaired and replaced by a dentist. Ted Bundy was free to walk without cuffs or shackles, spending hours in the prison library doing research for his own case. And John Wayne Gacy was permitted to carry tools around and serve as a handyman throughout the prison. Some of these are privileges absent from the average inmate's daily routine, but it all goes to show that some serial killers are treated well in prison.